ज्ञानम परमम ध्येयम नॉलेज इज सुप्रीम so in the last class we had stopped with a question and the question was is it impossible to get an idea about rotational and vibrational levels of say hydrogen dihydrogen because what we have seen is that when you are talking about diatomic molecules of course so far we have not talked about anything beyond diatomics so for diatomic molecules we have understood that an essential condition for microwave activity is that there must be a permanent dipole moment and for vibrational spectrum for ir spectrum essential condition is yeah is that vibration must bring about a change in dipole moment but then uh, it boils down to the molecule must have a permanent dipole moment for diatomic molecules because if it is something like dihydrogen or iodine then no amount of stretching can produce a dipole moment in uh, say homonuclear diatomic molecules okay so we had said that it is possible to get an idea about these uh, vibration and rotational levels and we had said that it is possible to do it by uh, using what is called raman effect by doing raman spectroscopy you can circumvent this problem and that is what we initially thought we'll discuss now but then uh, well this morning i changed my mind because there is a more fundamental question that remains to be answered i think it is better to answer that question before going on to another kind of spectroscopy so we have a little bit of change in plan we take a rain check on raman spectroscopy for now and today we ask that question that has been haunting us for quite some time and that question is we are saying that all the selection rules are derived on the basis of transition moment integral or transition dipole moment being non zero where did that come from okay we have postponed that in class uh, usually that discussion comes first but uh, my experience is that if we do that first very often we lose uh we lose the class because people think what is going on so now that we have established that transition moment integral is uh, a very important uh, parameter that decides which transitions will take place and which transitions will not let us now try to address this question over the next few classes what is the origin of transition moment integral okay so we do that by performing a semi classical treatment of interaction of radiation with matter and when i say semi semi classical what we essentially mean is that we are going to model radiation in the classical way what is the classical description of light electromagnetic wave light is an electromagnetic wave what does that mean oscillating so oscillating electric and magnetic field now you are saying that they are perpendicular to each other but of course i mean and and these two are uh, perpendicular to the direction of propagation of light and that is the description of polarized light right in unpolarized light you have electric field oscillating in all possible planes perpendicular to this a uh, direction of propagation of light and uh, you have magnetic fields that are perpendicular to it so that is the description of light that we are going to adopt here okay and for now we are going to work only with the electric field and we'll tell you why so light is modeled as this oscillating electric field classical description what about matter for matter we have to use wave function that's why it's called semi classical you can do a complete quantum mechanical description of this problem as well okay so now and in doing this uh, see in chemistry more often than not we stick to this uh, time independent schrodinger equation isn't it hydrogen atom problem and all that we have uh, 
it is it has been sufficient to work with time independent Schrodinger equation not in this case. Here we will have to use time dependent Schrodinger equation and what we are going to essentially use eventually is time dependent perturbation theory. You are familiar with time independent perturbation theory you have done that already. Uh, time independent uh, time dependent perturbation theory is actually easier I think than time independent perturbation theory. So, we will take that as it comes it will come today itself. But before we uh, plunge into that let us remind ourselves of some basics of uh, this time dependent Schrodinger equation ok. Now, I have written psi in a little funny manner a little different from what I usually write right. This is uh, given my poor artistic abilities this is capital psi and when I write capital psi what I essentially mean is that this capital psi is a function not only of the spatial coordinates but also of time all right. You have dealt with wave functions like this earlier I hope. Whenever you have done that what is the first step that you have taken yeah. You try to do a separation of variables right separate the uh, spatial variable from temporal variable. For that what is the first condition you have to write this uh, wave function which is a function of spatial as well as temporal variable you have to write it as a product of a space dependent part and a time dependent part. And the convention we are going to follow is this is a product of psi which is a function of x y z. Now, this is capital psi this is small psi, but then how many times will I say small psi I will just say psi. If I mean capital psi I will say capital psi multiplied by time dependent part phi and once again how many times will we write x y z t and all that we will simply write it as psi into phi. So, please do not get confused remember small psi means time independent spatial part of the wave function phi is the time dependent space independent part of the wave function. Are we clear so far? And with this we have to remind ourselves uh, what is Schrodinger equation time dependent Schrodinger equation ok. What is time dependent Schrodinger equation before that let me write the uh, time independent uh, sorry uh, let me write the Hamiltonian for that. And I will write it as h 0 because we are going to use perturbation theory we are going to bring in a correction term later on. So, h 0 as you know is minus h cross square divided by 2 m multiplied by del square I will not repeat what del square is everybody knows right plus a potential this potential is dependent on x y and z time independent space spatial coordinate dependent potential ok. Now, what is the time dependent Schrodinger equation? When this h 0 operates on capital psi it gives you minus h cross by i del del t of capital psi. Okay. Of course, we are going to write this as a product of space and time parts we write it like this h 0 operates on psi into phi this is also del del t of psi into phi and this h 0 is time independent is not it right. So, phi is a constant as far as this is concerned. So, we might as well bring phi out and write like this phi multiplied by h 0 into psi and here this psi is time independent. So, that comes out. So, I can write it like this psi multiplied by minus h cross by i del del t of phi, but then it does not make sense writing del anymore is not it because whatever is it is operating on the derivative is a function of time and nothing else. So, I might as well write this as minus h cross by i d phi d t. And the next step is also simple divide both sides by the product of psi and phi. What do you get on the left hand side? You get h psi divided by psi on the right hand side you get this whole thing divided by phi. Now, left hand side is a function of spatial coordinates only no time right hand side is a function of temporal coordinate time only no spatial part. 
So, both sides have to be equal to some constant and as we know already what the left hand side is we write this simply as E energy and that is how you get first of all the time independent Schrodinger equation H0 psi equal to E psi and the time dependent part separates out like this you can write minus H cross by I d phi dt is equal to E phi or d phi dt is equal to minus I H cross E phi minus I E phi divided by H cross is that right, right. Hence what is the expression for phi that you get, yeah, e to the power I mi minus I E T divided by H cross. You can write it in two, three different ways. This is what we will write for now. So far so good. So this psi then. I do not need this anymore. This becomes the space dependent psi multiplied by e to the power minus i e t divided by h cross. Okay, right. So, this is our separation of variables into spatial and temporal ones. We separate the equation into a time independent part and a time dependent part and we get this expression of the wave function which is dependent on uh, which is a product of a spatial part and a temporal part. This is the form of the wave function that we are going to use in our subsequent discussion. I think this is something that you know already. So, I hope uh, this was a recap for everyone. Any questions so far? Any doubt? Great. Now, what we will do is we are where are we going to use it? We are going to use it in spectroscopy. Spectroscopy means transition from one state to the other, right. And in the systems that we have studied so far, rigid rotor and uh, harmonic oscillator, then anharmonic oscillator, there are of course many states, right. But then we always talk about one transition at a time, do not we, right. There is something called one photon rule. Do you know one photon rule? What is it? one photon can bring about only one transition, right. So, your photon is not like Rajnikanth's bullet. Rajnikanth can kill multiple uh, villains using the same bullet and a knife. Everybody knows that uh, cliched story, but your photon is not like that kind of a bullet. One photon can only bring about a transition from one state to another state. It cannot get separated and bring about many, many transitions, okay. So, what we will do is we will at least to start with keep it very simple and we will try to understand a two state system, a two level system. Yes sir. So, physical significance is something that uh, we have studied uh, long ago that it travels as packets, right. So, what it says is that you cannot split a photon. So, you can actually add two. So, there is something if we get time we are going to discuss there is something called nonlinear spectroscopy. Nonlinear spectroscopy means, uh, well you know uh, this Bohr resonance condition, right. You have an energy gap delta E. If the uh, frequency of the photon is such that H nu is equal to delta E, then it will be absorbed. Sometimes what happens is energy gap is 2 into H nu. Even then if you use an intense field of light, say laser light, then you can bring about a transition. What is happening essentially is that you can think in the classical way, two photons are uh, uh, adding up to bring about this transition. So, what we do is we invoke what are called stationary states. We will encounter them when we talk about Raman spectroscopy. But then one photon cannot get split into two. Photon is a fundamental uh, unit of light you can think, okay. That is where uh, it comes from Planck's law. Uh, that is where one photon rule comes from, okay. So, we are going to talk about now a two level system. Let us say 
this is characterized by energy E L, L for lower, but this one is M, not U for upper, but M the next letter in the alphabet. This of course is also characterized by capital Psi, Psi L and this is the wave function for this is capital Psi M. All right. Let us start with a situation where this level is populated and this level is not, very much like your uh, harmonic oscillator or anharmonic oscillator. So, population of this is 0, population of this is some finite population, the sum probability of this state being populated. Okay. In that case, what will be the wave function of the system? if only the lower level is populated, it will be psi L, right? You do not worry about whether there is any psi M, psi Q, psi R, nothing is there, right? But what happens when you bring in light and cause a transition? What we call in, in spectroscopy, what we call a transition is in the language of quantum mechanics, superposition. or mixing of states. What we, what we are trying to say is this light comes in and part of the system so that this probability of the upper state being occupied also increases. Okay? Now after some time, some time after you switch on the perturbation let us say. Then what happens? What would should be the uh, wave function that properly describes the system? Yes, the, what he is saying is right. What he is saying is capital Psi L plus lambda into capital Psi M. Okay. To keep it uh, more symmetric, as you will see symmetry is very important in, uh, in chemistry actually, not just spectroscopy, we will write a more symmetric expression. And that expression is this capital Psi is equal to let us say some coefficient L multiplied by capital Psi L plus some coefficient Cm multiplied by capital Psi M. Fair enough. Instead of 1 and lambda as coefficients, I am trying to use Cl and Cm as coefficients. All right. Let us go back one step and think at time t equal to 0, what is the value of Cl? What is the value of Cm? Cl is equal to 1 and what is Cm? 0. So, I will just write that down so that I do not forget. At time t equal to 0, Cl is equal to 1 and Cm equal to 0. What happens for uh, initial time, small time, let us say a very small time has elapsed after I have switched on the perturbation. Cl will still be close to 0, uh, close, close to 1, Cm will still be close to 0, right? So, let me write like this, when time t tends to 0, I can write to a good approximation, Cl is approximately equal to 1 and Cm is approximately equal to 0. We are going to use this approximation a little later. Are you okay with this? Understood? I am not saying, uh, okay, but let us come back to that discussion later. What happens sometime after I have switched on the perturbation? Let it be initial time. Now, Cl will decrease a little bit from 1, Cm will increase a little bit from 0. Now, you need to write the linear sum as a wave function. Okay? And if you work at long times, after switching on the perturbation, then of course, Cl and Cm can even become uh, comparable depending on what kind of system you are working with, what kind of uh, electric field you have used. 